also has to be Yes. Yeah. 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 Hi guys, thanks for coming. Um, I would like to introduce, if you don't know him already, Dr. Ruggiero Labreglio Ogrino. Um, he's a senior lecturer at Massey University in the School of Built Environment, where he teaches digital construction and research methods. He got his PhD in 2016 from Scuola Interpolitecnica on human behavior and fire. Uh, to date, he has been investigating human behavior in several different types of disasters, such as building fires, earthquakes, and wildfires. Um, his research uses new technologies, such as virtual and augmented reality, to investigate behaviors and training people. He has published more than 50 papers, 30 of them are journal articles, he has quite um, a, a career, and, and he's just starting. So I'm going to turn it over to you, and um, I'm excited about hearing thank what you have to say today. Thank you, Erica, and thank you all for coming. And I hope it's going to be a pleasant experience for you. I've been trying to, uh, to run this, uh, uh, this presentation over and over in the last year, but never with such a smart audience. So <laughs> it's a, a good test to understand if it works also for really geek people. I would like to thank you also, Erica, for inviting me for the second time. It has been a real pleasure. Been here for two months. On Friday, unfortunately, I'm gonna go back to New Zealand, but I'll be back. It's a promise. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are gonna see a bit of what I've done so far using this new technology, and uh, as uh, has been something really exciting for me because it's uh, they look like toy. They are toy. And uh, it's really fun to do research with this technology if you know how to use them. Because you can do a really big disaster with people if you let them try these things and you don't know how to handle everything. So my background is in civil <coughs> engineering. I started uh, more than 10 years ago or 10 kilograms ago. And uh, <laughs> I started in my home university. It was really nearby my place. Didn't know what was university. I was the first in my family going to university. My mother was proud of me. Still during the PhD, they didn't understand what was a PhD. Still I don't know if they have got the point about what was a PhD, because you get the title doctor since the undergrad in Italy. So when you say, I'm gonna get a PhD, I'm gonna get a doctor, and they will say, you were already twice doctor. So according to the Italian standard, I'm Dr. Q. <laughs> And uh, at the end of the PhD, I was really open to go anywhere. And literally, I got an offer from the other side of the world to go to work uh, at, the, at the beginning as a postdoc in uh, New Zealand, and then eventually as a, as a lecturer and senior lecturer. And if you see the shape of uh, New Zealand, it's pretty similar to Italy, <laughs> with the difference that uh, <laughs> we are 60 million in Italy and 4.5 million in New Zealand. So, it's basically empty. <laughs> and uh, people have been arriving there 700 years ago, 800 years ago. At that time, we have already needed done a bit of mess around Europe, with the Roman Empire, start uh, banking, uh, borrowing money everywhere in the in the Europe. So we have. It's a really different country, but it's a really exciting opportunity for me because it's always a challenge to be. Uh, in a new culture and try to understand what's the social rules in this country. But I, I must say that it's a really, it has been a really welcoming country. I'm pleased to be there and to be back in a couple of weeks. I've been working uh, as a simple researcher, but now I'm also involved in uh, several journals as a editor member and associate editor. So uh, I've been uh, doing uh, research from a different angles and I'm really enjoying being on both sides of the fights, pushing for your paper or try to convince someone that need to do some work on their own papers. So in uh, Messi I'm doing a lot of uh, teaching regarding a new technology and especially BIM, Build Information Modeling, that is a new philosophy in the construction fields to manage information and share information. And I teach uh, a bit of application in the industry whenever I have time about fire safety or BIM can uh, make a change also in the fire industry. I explain a lot of, uh, to my students a lot of application of virtual augmented reality is gonna make a big change in the industry and it's already starting. 
and also how to play with different 3D scanning technology, starting from really expensive uh, uh, 3D scanner with smartphones. And uh, basically one of my assignments for them is to develop a 3D model using photogrammetry and their own smartphone. Some of them really like that, some others they want to kill me, but that's life. So let's start with some definition. We have virtual reality and uh, augmented reality that we are going to discuss in this presentation. And there is a lot of confusion out there, most of the time even promoted by big company. I won't make any name. <laughs> Mixed reality is what we have in the between. So we have a continuum that goes from reality and uh, virtuality. When we are in reality is what we perceive now. And when we are in virtual reality is when we perceive completely immersed and digital environment. So the simple example to understand instead what is augmented reality is try to make a blend of the two concepts and try to have something that looks like that. <laughs> we have something real and we have digital contents that enhance our experience. They are called holograms and they can be perceived in a different way. We can perceive it with a smartphone and a camera that is looking and streaming in real time a video. Or we can use some really fancy glasses like those one. They cost only 3,000 US dollar. If you wanna try later, you will see that you put them on and you see through the glasses holograms popping around and interacting with the real space. They don't conflict any longer with the space because they are capable to do 3D mapping in real time. In other words, in simple words, it does a 3D scanning of this room in a few seconds. And so the digital contents are capable to interact with the real space. How many of you have been experienced virtual reality? So when I started this research, virtual reality was something really uh, new. But what was new, it was the immersive virtual reality. Because all of us are really experienced virtual reality in many different ways. And one of the easiest things to do that is playing video games. Playing video games allow us to, to have this nice experience of, the, of a new world, but most of the time we do it to a screen, so it's a not immersive experience. It has become really popular with immersive technology, like using those headsets. When I started doing my development in virtual reality, I was using the development kit of Oculus. It was four or five years ago. It was super expensive to get. You, have, you were supposed to have a super expensive computer to run it. Every morning you were plugging it, and if there was a change in a, one of the driver of the graphic card or wherever it was like. So every day was a morning prayer to <laughs> ask God that it was working. Otherwise, you, literally I was spending most of the time half morning just to understand what was wrong. Instead, now we have a device like this one, released last year, that they cost just 300 US dollar and they are plug and play. You can develop with a really stupid computer, not really expensive computer, put the application on top of them and run your experiment. So the possibility also to do virtual reality uh, research has become really easy because we need just to carry this device around and do data collection. So let's go to augmented reality. So how many of you have you experience instead of augmented reality. And if you think we have been experiencing augmented reality for quite a lot, especially with re reversing camera, that is something that is pretty common here in the uh, in US, in New Zealand as well. In Italy we don't need it because we we bump <laughs> against the other camera. You know, that's it. So you learn uh, with physics. We don't need the uh, augmented uh, experience. But as you know, augmented reality is becoming something really popular because now there are games, there are applications that make your yourself or your partner more beautiful. And so you can send a nice picture, Christmas card to everyone, and probably it's not you then. <laughs> but you can do a lot of things, but also serious stuff related to research. 
So this is just a fun introduction. Now I'm gonna start showing a lot of uh, applications that we have been uh, doing, uh, uh, working in Sweden, uh, in, uh, in Italy, in uh, New Zealand, in so many parts of the world. We have developed so many applications, and today I would like to just give you an idea about different possibility and different application of this technology, mainly focus on augmented reality. I'm Italian, you know, my mom is one of the most important women in my life, and I've been spending most of the time <laughs> hearing that stuff, and now my work is like that. So, but now let's start talking about serious stuff. So we have been starting, we starting personally doing a lot of uh, vi uh, virtual reality uh, research with uh, Enrico Ronchi and uh, Daniel Nilsson. Probably you remember Enrico was a visitor here a few years ago, more than a few years ago, I guess. And uh, when I was in Sweden, they, and I, visit, I was visiting Sweden, they managed to do a lot of data collection about defining the best design for a tunnel exit. And this was a kind of continuation of what was uh, Daniel's research way in uh, 2009, he finished his PhD. In his case, he was bringing physically people in a tunnel and expose them to different, building different kind of exit layout and try to ask people, hey, what do you think about it? Try to imag imagine the cost of doing that. Instead, they managed to scale down and have many more set up of exit just using virtual reality and bringing people in uh, this uh, experimental setup called cave that is still uh, quite expensive it will i think it cost less than a uh, half million dollar it's quite difficult to maintain it's it's a real uh, lab facility so they managed to bring people more than almost 100 people in this facility and ask them about different layout and what i did i was helping with the statistic and try to understand which setup was the best one and uh, all different elements were affecting the final outcome of that research. So you can start thinking, yeah, but it's quite, still quite expensive to do so. So what we did then after all, after that, uh, Enrico managed to collect other data using a Samsung Gear VR. Probably the cost, the full cost is less than uh, 2,000 US dollar. And the end of the research was that Basically, in terms of design and uh, feature that we collect using both technology, we didn't have much difference. That means that we can really start using a less immersive experience with the goggles, smartphones, and do really fancy research and provide really interesting results in terms of which design is the best fire safety design signal system to provide information to the people, to guide people outside a building. So this is uh, something that we published probably last year, so it's something really fresh that got out there in the community. Another thing that we have been doing is to, this summer, your summer, not my summer, because we are swapped. I was in uh, visiting Italy, uh, Università Politecnica delle Marche, and in that case they repeat, they did a lot of experiment to test a lot of system um, that guide people automatically or not automatically outside using different signal that are inspired pretty much from the one that you find in a aircraft. And uh, when I was there, they did physically those experiments. I did when I was there, help them to develop this application that was mimicking the same experiment in virtual reality. So now you see what a person is experiencing with the glasses. So they are asked to evacuate as soon as possible. So they use all the information that is inside the, the, the experience and they try to find a way out. And here we put a trick that he was mimicking the same trick that they had in the real experiment. You will see that the lights are gonna have a, a shift at some point. So you see that the person decided to go that way and then eventually the sign is telling you, hey, go the other way. So uh, it's a dynamic system. And uh, we are still doing uh, at this stage data collection 
but we already got some interesting uh, differences and similarity with the real experiment that were run a few years ago there. So we are still doing data collection and try to also to validate what's the potentiality of using virtual reality as a completely uh, different approach compared with the real experiment with the, in which you need to actually develop the sign, put them in place, stop a facility instead in that case it cost us almost nothing just the cost of a headset and a computer i've been uh, doing a lot of investigation about virtual reality since my master thesis and i was using this fancy software probably you recognize it and uh, because it was the easiest way for me at that time to create different uh, choice conditions for people and try to understand what are the choice made by people uh, when they need to select an exit. So the easiest thing for me to do it was to create different experimental design condition, different experimental scenario, and show people videos about what was the emergency and ask them, okay, what would you choose in this situation? We developed 12 different scenario and I managed to spread this survey online and I managed to collect data from 200 people. And we managed to then develop a model that was telling us pretty much what was the social interaction and social influence and the distance impact on the decision. So we were trying to weight what was the impact of these different factors that we knew already they were affecting the decision but we didn't actually know what was the weight. Of course, the first things that you can have in mind is, is pretty ugly and not realistic. And that was something that it was really bothering me during my PhD. So what I did in this second, uh, in this third paper is to enhance this experience, creating something that it was much more realistic. In this case, it was an experience done with a game engine called Unity and I managed to recreate something similar to the first experiment. Different scenario, pretty much the same variable. And then I was asking people to make a choice between the exit. So it was much more realistic. We managed to get results that were pretty similar to the first set of experiment. But in this case, while in that case, most of the participants were Italian. In this case, I managed to spread it worldwide and I managed to collect data from 1,500 people. So we managed also to investigate cultural difference in terms of decision making. And we managed also to prove that people from different countries had a tendency to have different social interaction with people while choosing ex exit. This paper is now under review and hopefully it's gonna be out by the end of this year. Of course, I wasn't happy about these results because it was not immersive. It was still a video. People were still at home. There would be probably a kid bothering them. Mom, mom, I want to see, I want to do it. Or things like that. So there was not so much control. So what I managed to do last year, eventually I managed to, to get enough funding to buy a, a bit of a VR equipment. And I had also the possibility to have a visiting a student from uh, Belgium, Elise. And we play a bit together to develop something that it was much more immersive. And uh, we develop uh, an assist that he was the supervisor from Belgium that is my student lead, dealer from Europe. Whenever I need a student, he's the one sending them. And uh, we managed to create a really nice experience in which people could actually walk in the VR ex experiment and uh, there was a space of a six meter by se seven meter that he was overlapping with a digital <coughs> space. It was quite expensive uh, piece of equipment that we had to buy at that time. Now we can repeat the same experiment with 300 bucks just to tell you what has been changing the last year in just one year. And all the experiment looked like is something like yeah, that. Yeah, just uh, like noise and so the games. And we asked the person to get inside this room, familiarize with the room, and tell them, okay, just familiarize with the with the experience, and try to walk inside the space, make you comfortable because no, you won't end up bumping anything. 
And uh, then we were telling them, okay, now you get out of the exit and just wait there. And the instruction was then, okay, this is now the second experience. You're going to end up in the same room and there will be a meeting. Just go to the red spot and wait there. That was the instruction. And uh, also the, the goal to let them enter exit from the taxi is to make them familiarize with the taxi. So we can start making the assumption that there was a familiar way in and out for them. So this is the actual one of the eight and see the go through the experience. A random words sometimes you when you arrive at things. So that was me just pretending to make a choice and to be confused. But this is the experiment that we did. But we have also the dark side of this research. Because it's not just the beautiful things that I'm showing you. We do a lot of experimental design. And we do a lot of data collection and data cali and model calibration. So what I told my student eventually after six months, it was like, congratulations, we spent six months just to calculate those four numbers. <laughs> Then for her was like, really? <laughs> and then we play a bit, we did an implementation. Basically those four numbers are the weight of the different factor affecting the choice. Number of people in front of an exit, the distance of the exit, the fact that there is a, a smoke or not, getting out of this exit and familiarity of this exit. We didn't invent anything new, we won't win the Nobel Prize for this research because it's, not, it's something theoretically that we already knew. But we managed to create something that is weighting all the factor at the same time. Because there are a lot of experiments showing ah, there is statistical difference between uh, this condition and the other condition that are important to know if you do a, a simulation, but then you need to implement it. And this model has four numbers that can be numerically compute to calculate probability in an Excel sheet for each agent and can be applied for FDS plus EVAC or any other software. We are about to publish these results and do also more data collection. But one limitation is that still people knew that they were in a VR lab. So they might expect that it was an experiment. They, are, they know that it's not a real emergency. What we are going to do next is to combine and rescale those data with exit choice that we managed to collect in the last year in the four evacuation from our library that will allow us to rescale this sample. And this is a technique well known in the transportation modeling in which you put data of experiment with data of real situation choice scenario in which instead the main factor were social influence and uh, distance of the exit. So we are going to merge those data eventually and create a more reliable model that can be quite easily more trustworthy compared with this one that is instead based only on the VR data. We have been working a lot of, about uh, to investigate human behavior in terms of people navigate inside the space. And that was done using the, some random data that Enrico collected and he didn't really know what to do with this data. We asked just people to walk in the tunnel and to get an exit and we start thinking, can we recycle a bit of this data and do something cool with it? It was, they were there. And then we had the idea to calibrate a flow field cellular automaton model but not really the, the model, the flow field that people use to move inside the space. And uh, the question was, yeah, cool idea, how? And uh, I managed to split the, the problem in simple problems. 
I was assuming that this was the trajectory that you were collecting and try to understand what was the choice made by the person in each step. And so I was investigating them, the trajectory, and try to understand what was their choice in each data point that we could observe. And then I managed to create a nice likelihood function and try to calibrate different models. This is the general assumption that we have H. This is the general assumption that we have uh, in every cellular automaton model, that the people go straight to the exit. We use radial flow field, and we assume that the agents go straight away to the exit. Instead, by calibrating the model, we observe that instead the flow field should be a bit bent. And uh, we also managed to provide the formulation for that. But the question at the time was like, yeah, but we did the data collection in VR and people were using a joystick to move around. Probably that was biasing, uh, creating a big bias for all the results. I managed to find data collected by a crazy professor in, uh, no, it's not crazy, it's, it's a super cool geeky guy. I'm recording, so I need to be by nice to everyone. <laughs> Don't wanna be so. And then we work a bit to, together we collect thousand and thousand, probably we use 10,000 trajectory, and we repeat the experiment with this data using the trajectory collect with a camera put on the top of an atrium in the engineering forum, informatic forum of Edinburgh, and we observed that the results were exactly the same, that people didn't go. And if you think it makes sense, because when you get closer, you're not a point that is moving in the space, you need to steer as well. So it's better if you point something that is <coughs> exactly the exit and then you start steering while you're approaching it. So if you use the, a model that simplifies the human like a dot, you need to get account for this kind of behavior that the simple model cannot account because it's just, the human is just a dot in a, in a grade. We have been doing a lot of experiment and this is another video with a bit of swearing Apologies for that, but there is a scientific region, uh, reason behind that. We were trying to understand the interaction with people with a, an aggressor in a virtual reality. And this is an experiment that was done uh, in reality by Alistair, who's gonna get graduated hopefully this year uh, at the Imperial College. And uh, we wanted to replicate this experiment and try to understand all the social influence affected the, the decision of people to react to an aggressor or not or to stay in place recreating the same experiment in virtual reality so in this case it was a really nice experiment we spent three months to develop it and people are uh, immersed in a gym and they are convinced that there are other people with them in another room that are playing the same game and they start interacting with each other now you will see that there is the instructor there getting in and telling them to present each other. So there were pre-recorded video and everyone believes that there is Hi, someone I'm else on the other me. side I'm and playing the roles of these other yeah. players. Yeah. And then yeah. we play a lot to, to have different audio files for each person and they start waving each other, interacting with each other so they can get socially attached to the other people. And then eventually, once everyone introduced to each other, we will have the, the instructor. It was a long presentation for everyone. The instructor go away and say, okay, now just uh, go and familiarize with the, with the space. And you will see that now an aggressor is gonna come. And that's why I need to swear a bit, to be a bit aggressive. If I touch you, you will lose the experiment and leave with no money. You understand? You came here with 40 quid. And if I touch you, you will leave with five. <laughs> right, you. I'm going to touch you. Before <laughs> 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 
the way to move around is to shake your hands. And there is a reason for this. <laughs> it's not doing yoga, you don't worry. You're the only one left. And it's pretty scary if you do it, and you see someone running towards you. It's, although you know, it's a bit like, whoa. And uh, we were uh, uh, having the shaking to move people, because we found that the people were moving inside the space. So to avoid motion sickness, one of the first things that you need to do is convince your brain that you're actually moving. And by just doing this, this exercise, you trigger the right parts of your brain to make him convinced that you're actually moving. I'm quite sensitive to motion sickness. And when we tried this for the first time, it was like, oh, I'm running in a VR space. I don't even feel sick. And uh, the other nice story behind it was that Alistair was recording the swearing part in his apartment in Oakland and was hoping that no one was calling the police because he was actually shouting in his own room. <laughs> so a bit of uh, nice side effects of this research. The reason I went to uh, uh, New Zealand was to instead uh, start doing uh, VR for training purposes. And it was with my ex-boss, Dr. Gonzalez, that we develop uh, uh, a virtual reality experience to train people about what's the best things to do in case of an earthquake. So we started with a 3D model of a hospital, Oakland City Hospital, and we managed to develop a customized uh, uh, VR experience to train people about the best behavior to have inside a, a, such a disaster. And we had also the possibility to have haptic stimuli to people. There was a customized uh, platform and beside there was a, a amplifier connected with the computer and it was getting amplified the sound of the earthquake and connected with this with vibration. The device was bought from the US, it's called Butt Kicker. You develop it, really fancy name. It's actually called like that and you can buy it because if you want to have your couch vibrating when you're watching a movie with the cars, you can feel it. So, and there is a market for it. That's the funny thing, <laughs> not that someone developed it. And this is one of the... Auckland City Hospital is the testing ground for the university's latest earthquake research project. We can adjust it if it's too loose or too tight. The virtual reality program rates how people react in quakes and aims to improve how we respond during an emergency. Newsroom tested out the program, which has had more than 200 people take part. Going through the borders, uh, then it's the escalator to go up the stairs. In the simulation, participants are asked to walk through the hospital. Instructions lead you to a room. Got to go inside and it's some kind of presentation. Keep your items on the desk. And then the shaking begins. I've got my key come down. Oh, it's shaking. I feel it shaking. Am I meant to crouch down? I'm going to crouch down. survey of the people were behaving and this was part of one experiment but we did also another experiment in which we were training people and try to understand what was their increment of understanding of what's the best things to do in case of an earthquake so the data that you observe here are the data regarding the, the staff that participated in this experiment and the visitors before and after we managed to show that using the VR we had the uh, nice increment of the information after the training. But this opened a lot of questions in my future career. <coughs> Does this work much better than just showing a person a video or give them a leaflet or what's the, what's especially the information they're gonna retain after a few weeks? So we didn't have the chance to investigate that in this research, but then I had the chance to play with this. And I start doing it uh, just using a really simple training that 
probably is one of the most common for fire safety. You want to use a fire extinguisher and <coughs> to teach the pass manual. What we did is, in that case, we managed to just ask a couple of colleagues from Canada uh, to give us a free license of their existing uh, simulation. We start collecting data. We managed to collect data for from uh, 45 people. Mm -hmm. And we were doing data collection yeah. everywhere in Oakland. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we repeat it. I need to thank uh, my colleague uh, Phil Jackson for helping quite a lot in this data collection involving the industry in it. And we repeat the experiment with other 45 people, in which case they were using a video taken from YouTube to do the training. We select one of the best that you could take from uh, YouTube. And so we were comparing the results. This is our face when we discovered that ER was working. We were still in a bar because I was supposed to fly out of New Zealand in a couple of days and wanted to show the results. So we meet up with my student that helped with the data collection, Nita. And when we found the results, we were like, yay! <laughs> so this is what we discovered. We can have, uh, this is the knowledge that the people, we were interviewing the people before, after, and after three, four weeks. So we were asking them, hey, how would you use a fire extinguisher? And so they were giving us answer, and we were then scoring their answer, and they could get something from zero to five. So you can see that the results here uh, before are pretty much the same. I managed to do a statistical test to see if there was difference, and pretty much there is no difference at the beginning between the two samples. After, you can see that PR worked slightly better. The video was still okay. If I was just looking at this chart, I would say, eh, do we really need VR? Yes, slightly better, but probably not that, that good. The things that really struck us, and that's why we were happy, it was to see the results after three, four weeks. Mm -hmm. This is the slide where you should say, oh, let's do it again. So, and this was the results. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And it's really impressive. You can clearly see that there is no doubt on the fact that people were forgetting by using a simple video and remembering because you actually do things, you actually do mistakes, you actually learn by doing. So it's a mechanical way to learn in which you remember actually the action that you were taking. And uh, so I, um, I showed these results at CERN in Geneva, and they were thinking like there will be a big revolution for an organization like us because we need to do induction with 6,000 people every year. And I guess on this you have the same problem. You can start thinking for the future having training that are VR based and are much more reliable than simple clicking button, boring button in the building right across the, the whole year. We started playing quite a lot with this concept and with another uh, guest researcher from uh, Belgium, still sent by ANAS, we managed to develop a virtual reality training tool to train people what's the best things to do in case of a shooting scenario. And it was something that we decided to do because we found that there was a interesting topic because we were listening quite a lot of things, especially from the US. And I was a bit uh, silly thinking that that wouldn't be useful in you in New Zealand. After one month and a half, we started this research. Unfortunately, we had also in New Zealand the shooting uh, uh, scenario in Christchurch. And it was like one of the awkward feeling that I was doing research and it was happening right now in my own country. Also in this case, I don't have now the data because we are still writing the paper. We managed to see, to show that people were really getting a good training out of it. We managed to develop a different scenario and try to teach them what, when was the best things to do, uh, what, what, which situation was the best to run away, to hide or to fight against the, the shooter. And literally, when you fight, you grab object and you throw the object against the shooter. Instead, this is another application for hospital. 
this is an application developed by ANAS, and its uh, PhD research is uh, try to compare different training technology. This is a desktop version of his uh, serious game, in which you can see that the person, there is no audio because he was in French, so he said, I just send you the video, you won't understand otherwise. And uh, you can see that the person go around and try to handle an emergency. And uh, he has already started to do data collection in, uh, in a hospital in Belgium. And at the end, he's going to mm -hmm. compare different learning uh, uh, solution using slides, using text solution, or using a VR immersive solution. So you can see that the person is guided somewhere, that is going to be the, the brief, get familiar with the environment. Then emergency strike, you have the fire, and the person need to take care of the patients and uh, try to assess the situation and make the right decision. And if it doesn't, he receive feedbacks and a report explaining that what need to be done in a similar situation. I'll try to speed up. Augmented reality is something new in my research. I started a bit playing during my free time. This is a augmented visualization of a building formation model. It's an existing building in California that they used to do training for five fighters. They sent me just the, the file and I will start playing. And it was really exciting, this application, because the first time I showed to a friend, he looked at me and said, ah, you got a 3D printer. I was like, he was actually thinking that it was real. And that was the best feedback I could get because that's what we want. Create something that is so similar to reality that sometimes can be also perceived like real. And this was a simple application that I developed uh, for smartphone. Useless, but I found then on the internet another guy from uh, uh, UK, he used to be a teenager when he developed this application, that he developed this application for smartphone. Now there are a lot of concern about when we can use those applications, if it's right to use it, especially if you are getting stairs, you don't want people to look at the smartphone. And if you try on your Google map, there is also an application, augmented reality application in uh, beta testing that is putting arrows, digital arrows, to guide you. And I was using them in DC to find the White House anymore. But during the experience, they tell you, uh, don't forget to watch the street because you don't want to be run over by bicycle or, or cars whenever you cross some something. So what I did so far, so far is to do a comprehensive literature review and try to understand what has been done so far in terms of uh, with the augmented reality in the human behavior in disaster field. So I managed to identify quite a lot of study, not so many, and uh, I could see that there was an incremental trend of uh, application, most of it related to the possibility to have new, new hardware that allow you to do this development. And I found a nice experience in which people were announcing a drill for earthquakes, in which you can actually develop debris in, uh, in your own building and show what would be your, what is gonna be the look like of your uh, uh, building after an earthquake and try to ask people to evacuate, making sure that they avoid all the possible threat, or for tsunami evacuation, guiding them, or fire evacuation. And this is, for instance, is an example in which uh, teachers were trained about how to instruct pe uh, their student to do the maneuver of drop, cover, and hold. This is instead a system uh, to navigate people outside. And this was one of the most surprising applications. They were just using augmented reality to show the results of an evacuation simulation of an existing building. Instead of showing on the screen to your consultant what is gonna be the evacuation time, you can actually impose the evacuation simulation in your existing building and go around with a smartphone or tablet or in the future classes and see, hey, you see that we need to increase the, uh, the size of those exits or increase the number of exits can clearly see in the real space if there are things that don't work. So that was, a, I mean, a bit of bold conclusion that I, I think that this is going to be one of uh, the direction in which we need to move forward. 
and especially because there are a lot of new hardware that are popping up. HoloLens, this is the version one, was developed three years ago, now there is, or four years ago, now there is HoloLens 2. I haven't tried, but I'm really optimistic that it's a really piece of, uh, really good piece of uh, technology to do more research and to do more application. Meta 2 has the disadvantage that need to be plugged with a computer, so it's not easy to go around with your, carrying your own computer. And this is the device. The last one is uh, Magic Leap that I just bought here in US. And it's a computer, small computer connected with some glasses, and they allow you to have a VR experience, a AR experience for two, three, three hours in a row. And if you wanna try later, I can show you how you can play with dominoes and put all the dominoes pieces on the table and then move one and see all the domino effects propagate. propagate. So it's a really fancy technology that has just arrived on the market in the last years, but it has a lot of potential. Those devices cost quite a lot, thousands of US dollars, but I told you, I'm not expecting that this phone became like a few hundred bucks in a couple of years. So it's gonna be something that everyone can have. And uh, those are just few of the studies that we've been publishing about those experiments. I've been showing you just the white sides, but there is a lot of dark side in terms of stats, math behind it. Statistic is one of my favorite things to do in my research. I try to make this presentation just really like to give you ideas and post some new idea in your own mind. And of course, there are a lot of papers that are coming hopefully this year or next year, whenever I'm gonna find the time to, scribe, to write them. And I would like to thank you for attending this. And if you wanna have a good, uh, uh, try with a bit of VR and a bit of augmented reality, just stop or pass by my office uh, upstairs and I'll show you what we can do. It's just 10 bucks per, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's worth it, of course. Thank you so much. What do you use to develop the scenarios? Was the Unity or for? I was other? waiting for it. <laughs> and this is the answer, Unity. This is, for instance, is an experience that I developed with my colleague, Daniel Nielsen, in which we want to inst uh, study interaction with people. So it's quite easy to develop contents in Unity. It's, uh, it's a platform in which you drag and drop a lot of things, and then you need to write <coughs> quite a bit of coding to integrate and make sure that all the interactions works. And you can use it for VR, AR application, and uh, it's a company that is investing a lot of research. If you see, in fact, the development team, they do really fancy things. And uh, this can become easily the new generation of uh, evacuation simulator because the interaction between people are not that different from the one we use in our simulators. And it can be used also to render volumetric rendering. It can be used as a, I have a colleague that managed to develop his own uh, uh, smoke viewer with interaction also with the lights. So it was an upgrade, a bit of a smoke viewer, but it was just a prototype. It can be used because he has the possibility to program straight away shader, shadings. You can program di directly agents. You can implement your exit choice model for agents. You are God inside those platforms. And if you know how to use it, a really nice platform. And for education tools are really useful for me because many students can uh, download it for free and implement it. This is just an example of something that was done by one of my master students in three months. He developed a virtual reality application to train uh, people in the construction sites. So he was telling them, uh, I mean, of course he's not good in choosing music, but, <laughs> but he did quite a good job in uh, training people about what are the hazards that you get in an excavation place and uh, we were doing uh, helping them to identify those arts and do all the training 
and it could go to every company in Auckland that they wanted to participate just holding one of those because the application was inside three months with a bright student. I must say that it was one of the brightest so far. Oh, like, like nothing. The easiest things that you will do then is start to throw into people. I don't know why. We are really made in VR. So, this is something that you can do. Yeah? I had a question about the um, IRC. Yeah. Um, you compare the video versus the, um, the augmented reality, the VR. Training. Yeah. Did you compare to somebody who did actual live training? No, I'm just waiting for cash to do it. It's interesting, our, the Neutron reactor, the ones that trained um, 100 of their people, and they had a um, simulated training that, that would have worked for them, but they wanted to do a live fire instead. This is the massive one. We develop our own simulator that is even teaching you which one you need to use. In this case, I was telling my friend who used the water one, and we also create nice interaction. Huh? Yeah. yeah, nice. <laughs> do you think, uh, related to this, do you think that the clear increase in retention over time with use of the VR, do you think that has to do with the novelty of this? Do you think if everybody were using this for training 10 years from now, that would go away? I mean, is it... You do things. You think it's the physical movement and not the... Uh, has anybody ever tried to quantify like that? The, I mean, if you had done the When training, you watch, I might believe, but need to test this, my belief at this stage is not science, is that you watch a video, you stand, and you do just passive learning. Instead, whenever you use a VR application, you have a active learning. We can probably also have a VR training which you don't do nothing and try to see what's the results. Mm. That's how a good. You, how are you scoring the knowledge? So how uh, uh, depending if they were mentioning all the action, they were supposed to take. So like a, so if it's a it's yes. survey or something that they have There was to a coding that we were using to make sure that they were saying that you need to pull the pin, okay. aim at the fire, swipe. Got it, so you ask them what what yeah. what is the process and they have and to sit there. We decide not to use uh, tick boxes uh, because then in that case we will uh, suggest all the answer. Right. And it was something that I learned reading other papers. If you provide a person with the question, then they will choose what is the most reasonable choice. That doesn't mean that they knew before it. And it has been used in like surgical training for probably like 15 years. Yeah. Long time. Yeah. There is also a nice uh, literature review that we did uh, about all the application of VR done <coughs> for uh, training. So we managed to identify 15 journal papers showing different application. It's in one of the, it's one of the list, uh, one of the paper listed uh, at the end, and it was published a couple of, probably last year, and it's really nice lesson for everyone. Yep. I had a question. So it was interesting, the, the shake kind of table for the um, earthquake, and so she, I guess it was a person from the news <coughs> going yeah. through it. And so then she's like, oh, I'm crouching down, and now I'm standing back up again. But she didn't look to be moving. So how yeah. do you actually crouch down in that? We managed to do a simple approach, idiot-proof application, just one button. Okay. In that case, it was designed to have a person that was interacting with the space just using a button. They were moving around just looking at the direction they wanted to go and press the button. If they wanted to crouch if down. If they want to go that way. If okay. they want to crouch, there was a area in which they could click and they could crouch down and uh, they were asking also we asked them to talk loud because we were using uh, uh, the we we're trying to analyze the data their uh, discussion that what they were saying speak louder thoughts for another paper it's still uh, I think that's under review somewhere the safety science is gonna be and uh, I don't remember now the technique sorry it's uh, protocol analysis, something like that, in which you ask people to do an experiment and to speak loud about what they are doing, why they are doing things. And we managed to get really nice information also. So it was painful to remind the people, don't forget to speak, because they were like, ah! 
Yes. Yeah. How? Why? <laughs> yeah. So one thing, can you talk about, um, I'm not sure if you do it in your studies, but some of the stuff I've looked at, and I know you work with Enrico and Daniel quite a lot, mm -hmm. um, that they are also surveying people on how real it feels, so their perception of the realness. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Uh, that's something that generally we do, we try to ask people to perceive the realism of the simulation of the experience and uh, I must say that so far the, mo the biggest challenge is to recreate avatars that are real. Most of the time are perceived like really robotics because they move in a really awkward way and they speak in a really awkward way, especially when you use computer generated uh, voice. And it was one of the main things that we were try to tackle with the aggressor experiment, try to convince people that the other people were real, they weren't just avatars. But we need still to do a lot of research to understand how this can impact especially social influences. And because also the, the, the realism is important, it's also important to measure the level of stress that they get during those VR experience and compare them with the real drills. So there is quite a lot that need to be done. So based, uh, following up on that, the video gaming industry is like where all the money is and, and where a lot of the, uh, you know, the cutting edge of re realism, I suppose. Yeah. So <coughs> is there any chance of partnering with any of those that have like, maybe they even have proprietary tools to do that quickly and efficiently as opposed to how much work it takes to do with, with more I'm also traditions. always looking for people that want to do stuff. And it's just a matter to find the right people mm -hmm. that want to do these things. Because if you need to pay them, right. it you need, be possible. As far as, it, it needs to be something attractive and, them in a business way, but as I far as partnering or something. It's, it's probably it's, would be really important for investigating human behavior. For training, I don't know if we have super realistic things. If we have something that looks like a wall with a nice shading, or if it's super realistic that you get closer, you can see all, all the cracking, it's gonna make a big difference in the training. It's something that we need to, to test. Something, for instance, that we tried to do is to enhance also the VR with the uh, heaters. So we put, we did another experiment in which there was a heater in correspondence of the fire. So when you were getting closer, you could really feel <laughs> That's hot, nice. yeah. but we saw that eventually, although it was much more real, the results of the training was the same. Hmm. So we need to. So it might not be worthwhile. Yeah, we need yeah. to understand if we really need it. If it's just for a gaming purpose, it's something that you want just to make someone happy and really feel immersed. It's okay, but if it doesn't impact the training, there is a, a Silvia Rias in Lund University that she's gonna start doing some research <coughs> about having also augmenting experience in uh, fire via research. I don't know how much I can disclose. <coughs> she won the the crew scholarship, the SFP Julian crew scholarship to do this research. So probably next year we will we will see really something really fun and we will learn out of it if it's really necessary. I also find uh, uh, thinking about smell, shall we start include, including smell, stuff like that? Mm. And there are masks that are still a prototype that release just different kind of smells, so you need to buy the right smell that you want to use. <laughs> there is a lot of things. The important thing is to try to understand if it really matters. But really good point, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Reno. Yeah, if you want to try okay. any VR or AR things, <laughs> get your shot. <laughs>